Hello and welcome. This is part three of our series of short videos about building a C-sharp app to extract issue data from Jira. In this episode, we'll be logging into the Jira server and getting a response back. And that response will have our JSession ID, which we will save away and use to authenticate all of our future requests. Jira provides a REST API that we can contact to request this log, and we just need to pass it some valid credentials. It's a username, a password, probably hours, whichever ones you got. The crucial thing about these is that they need to be powerful enough to actually view the issues that you want to extract because the APIs that we'll be using, they respect issue level security. That's um, the Atlassian APIs and the Iona FX Business Intelligence Export API that we'll be using. So just use credentials that uh, can actually view the issues. So let's open up our script and get to work. I still have it open from the last episode here. We have three pieces of data that we need, that the APIs URL, our username and our password uh, and I think the way we'll handle these is we'll define them up here in our automate class in the main method and then we'll just pass them through to the constructor here that will keep the Jira request class a little bit cleaner um, more generalizable to other uses we we basically treat our automate class as the controller that's passing whatever we want to pass into the Jira request class which just makes a request from whichever API we're using to do that, we'll need our three variables up here in the main method. And I should say, in between these episodes here, I did um, paste this in up here because we'll use that in a minute. And you'll note I call it base URL. That's because I, I want to turn our three pieces of data into four pieces of data. I want to split that URL into two parts. First is this base URL, which I'll add right now. Um, base URL equals, and I'll copy and paste this up here. This part contains this base URL. This will be a part of every API request that we make. It has our protocol, our server address. You can see I'm using an EC2 instance, uh, our port, and then this Jira REST, which is the beginning of the path for all APIs in uh, Jira. Onto that, we will append each of our different API paths. And I'll start off with the login API which is a, uh, a very standard path. It's auth one session. You can look up the, the REST APIs in, in JIRA's documentation on the Atlassian site. String, we need our username. Username, that is a string. Obviously your user credentials will vary. This works because I am using the defaults that come when you install JIRA. I will need a user password. And the default for that that I have not yet changed is also admin. There are four pieces of data that we have defined and we need to pass them down to this constructor. So we'll pop down here and base URL login API, oops, login username and login password. That will pass the data through to the constructor. We need to change that constructor now to accept this data. Down here in Jira request in its constructor will take string. And you know what? I'm just going to call them the exact same things down here. No, I'm not. I'm going to call them new base URL because I'll create properties for these that will have the, um, the name. So string new login API, string new login user name, and string new login password. Okay, now our constructor is set up to receive those four pieces of data and then in the constructor we'll actually assign that to things like this base URL which we have to create because this class doesn't know anything about the uh, automate classes properties. We'll create the same things down here. Public string base URL private string login API, private string, login username, and private string, login password. Okay, so we've sent the data, received it, and now we can set it into properties here. Oh, new base URL. username and this dot 
login password. That's the last one. Password equals new login password. I'm going to use this for all of my properties in my constructor. Not sure why I didn't do that before. Just to be pedantic, I guess. All right, so we've created properties to hold the data. Now we uh, have changed the constructor to actually set those properties. One other thing the constructor needs to do. So when we call it, what we're planning to do is start the program, call the request object to actually do the request, and it will, in the end, uh, save our file. So we're not actually going to read anything back from this. Uh, so what I could do is I could create a method down here that says once we've created the request, run it. But instead, uh, just in the constructor, once we have set all the data that we need, let's run our functions in the right order. These functions like log into Jira, that needs to happen first. And then we need to parse the J session ID out of the response that we get back. Then we need to get JSON data, we need to call that. Once we've done that, we need to format as a CSV and then write to a file. Now our constructor will handle doing all that um, once it's set the data, it calls each of our functions in order. I did mention the issue level security thing. I should also mention here that, that using this JSession ID and stuff, we're going to set it into a cookie. That's cookies-based authentication. Uh, we'll be using cookies to authenticate. Um, and sending our username and password then basically over the wire unprotected. We can do that because all this traffic will stay on our internal company network. And honestly, that's the way most business intelligence and reporting um, extracts work. You're doing it inside your own company. So if you need to actually send this over the wild west of the open internet, then you should use OAuth for authentication. And Elastian has some documents on how to uh, use all OAuth with their service. And I'll, I'll put a link in... Um, in the description for this video that shows the uh, where to find that documentation. Okay, we've uh, we've set up all of the data that we need, so now we can actually start coding inside our login to Jira function. The whole purpose of this episode. So uh, we'll start off by creating a try catch block. This was error handling. And I could type do something here, but instead let's just actually do something. The steps to log into Jira. First, we need to create a request to send over that. Um, we need a request object for that. We'll use the web request, and that comes from the system.net namespace, which I have not included yet. And we'll actually have a few other namespaces that we need to, to throw into. So I'm just going to record them here as we go, and we can copy and paste them up to the top later. For system, Once we've got that in place, then we've got our, our web request object. and Let's create that web request and we'll just call it request. That takes a URL as the input. Now we have a URL that we can build. It's called this.base URL. And let's concatenate onto the end of that this.login API to form the complete endpoint for our request. That's what we're pointed at right now. And to that request, we're going to send some, some, uh, some data in a post. And that data will be a JSON format data, so we'll call this post data equals. Now I could actually use a tool to do this, but I'm just going to type the JSON menu because we're only sending two things here. It's a username, and that will be quoted off like that with a colon. Then we'll open a new uh, uh, double quote, and this dot login username is our username. That sends, sends the username and I'll close that off with a double quote. And then we need a comma to separate it from our second thing that we're sending, which is the password. Put password inside quotes and then colon. We'll open a new quote for our this.login password. And we need to close that off quote like that. Then we close our bracket, close the whole thing, and we're done. That will be our JSON string. It's sending a username and a password, and that's fairly simple. Now, the, the post data won't be sent over the wire as, as characters, as a string. It needs to be converted into an array of bytes, and for that, we'll use uh, 
the encoding libraries get bytes function. Um, and, and for that, we need to actually do another import here so using system.txt, which includes encoding and string builder, which we won't be using, but it's, that's normally the reason I include system.txt because string builder uh, helps you very efficiently build strings. With our, our system.txt included, we can go right ahead and create a byte array, which I'll call byte array. And we'll use the encoding libraries utf8.getbytes and pass into it our post data. That will take the post data string and convert it into an array of bytes. Uh, now, with these steps done, we can actually set our request properties. Our request object has a few different settings. First is the method, it is a post. The second thing is our content type, which is uh, JSON in our, our post data. So that's actually application JSON. And then request dot content length. And this is why we bothered to create our post data first and convert it to an array of bytes, because to get its length, then all we have to do is byte array dot length. And there we have our, our request set up to send this request will actually stream it out. Uh, so that's that's a stream object and stream is is another include. But so that's an IO function. So we'll use system.io to create our stream object. And let's call it data stream. Stream typing's getting sloppy. But data stream and that will be uh, that comes right from our request. There's a get request stream method which will return that then now that we've got it we can actually send our request out by just writing to this stream the data stream dot write and we'll write our byte array which is our data starting at the zero index and going through until we get to byte array dot length that says take bytes from the byte array starting at index zero and continue until we reach byte array length. And and with that all done, we can really just close this. Stream.close. Okay, that's it for sending our request. And now let's um, let's get our response back, right? So first we we'll use the request get response stream method to obtain that response to our request and we'll store it in a web response object. Now web response is also up in our system.net namespace so we don't need to include anything new to use that. That's got web response and web request both. A bunch of other useful stuff. Request.get response. That will will uh, get our response. Now from that response we'll actually need to pull out the stream of content that, that contains our data. And and I think we can just reuse our, our stream object. We've already created one and and we've closed it so we're not using it anymore so we can reuse that and that is uh, from our response object now we get the response stream and then to actually read that response as a string well, we need some help and there is a stream reader object which is built for that it um, takes a stream in and it can help put that stream as a string and that's part of system IO namespace so we've, we've already got that included in our code so let's create one of those stream reader reader I'll call it reader um, is a new stream reader formed with our data stream and uh, let's just use that response from a server as a string then equals reader dot read to end and with that all done the last step would then be to really save this into our login response property And there we have it. Although we could do a little cleanup too, we probably should. We can close our reader object. We're not using that anymore. Our data stream, data stream, uh, that can be closed as well. And then our response, that can be closed as well. That is cleanup. With that all done, I think we can we can give it a test. That was actually quite a few lines of code there. So we'll go back over here and oh, still there. Okay, we just get warnings. 
and oh no 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 we get errors oh yes okay so I didn't copy these to the top cut and paste okay that's the helpful thing about writing them there you get to look at them while you're coding and then uh, if you forget to put them at the top it will not compile let's try compiling again ah two errors left the left hand side of inside must be a variable property index 71 and risk risk okay so that's just a misspelling at line 85 let's fix that first typo save that and then we also have a problem at line 71 line 71 string post data hmm oh there it is Look at that an equal sign. Save that. Save that. And just warnings. That's what I was expecting. Okay, yes. Let's see if it runs. Started. It did its thing and it finished. That's fantastic. So I'm fairly happy at this point. We have no errors, but I can't really see much in the way of output here. At this point, I think it's time we add some debug output. In fact, we need to add some real error handling too. So we'll do that in the next episode.